Welcome, everybody, to the Grueling Truths NFL Show. I am your host for the NFL Show, Mike Goodpasser. Right now, I'd like to welcome in from the FF Faceoff, the real live at NFL Guru, Anthony Servino. How you doing, Anthony? I'm doing good, Mike. What about you? I'm doing great because I won a little money last night on the Chicago Bears. That was such a dis- I, I That's a disaster. The Cowboys. It's disaster. according how you look at it because I had money bet on the Bears. So the first quarter was a disaster, though, because I thought you guys were just going to blow them out of the water in the first quarter. Well, I mean, the first quarter they looked and did exactly what they did against Buffalo Bills. They set the tone. They ran the ball. They went down the field and scored, and then, you know. Uh, it's got to be Jason Garrett. I, I would even throw Kellen Moore. Um, I, I tweeted this last night during the game. I feel like last year's Cowboys, they played sound defense and ran the football. Uh, and this year's Cowboys, they want to go score to score. They want to throw the football all over the field and, you know, abandon the run. Now, the thing that struck me was after their first touchdown, they came back out. And they threw the ball twice immediately. And then they had a third down where they threw the ball. And they got the first down. But right there made me feel a lot better about my bet. Because when you go down the field, it was 16 plays and the majority of them are runs and you score. You get the turnover. You come back and you throw the ball immediately three times. It made absolutely no sense to me. You know, it, it, it doesn't. Not, none of it makes sense. Um, and I and yes, Ga- Garrett is going to get a lot of the blame, but I'm going to put some of it on Kellen Moore too because he's calling plays. And they're being approved by Jason Garrett. And we don't know that Jason Garrett didn't say, "Hey, I want to throw the ball here." So in the end, it all falls on the guy with the headset that can hear the offense and the defense. And they all got to go. Coach. Yeah, they had to fire them all. You know, I, I, I heard an interesting uh, interview on, I think it was uh, Mike Lombardi. He's a former NFL executive. He worked for Al Davis. Uh, he was on a radio show, and um, he was talking about the situation uh, where, you know, he said Jerry learned a lot from Al Davis, and it's just such a different game now. It was like back then it was playing checkers and now it's playing chess. Uh, And Jerry minimizes uh, the head coaching position and how valuable it is. Um, You know, really coaches all together. And he gets into talking about Jason Garrett. uh, And he's anytime they pan in on Jason Garrett, he's standing there and clapping, standing there and uh, just standing there. He's never looking at, you know, in-game film. He's never talking to his – he just stands. Well, this is the thing, though. Jerry Jones is not Al Davis, just like Mike Brown's not Paul Brown. And I think this, if Al Davis were alive at any prime and Paul Brown was alive at any prime, they would still be winning because they know football. Jerry Jones played college football at Arkansas. He thinks he knows something, and he doesn't. Al Davis was a great football coach before he ever took over running the Raiders. And Jerry Jones was a businessman. And there's a huge difference there. With Mike Brown, I mean, come on. He just he got the Bengals because of who his daddy was. And they're not the same thing. And I think it's comparable there because the way Al Davis and Paul Brown wanted to do things, you knew were right because there was a track record there with them. With Jerry Jones, there is a track record now, and with Mike Brown, and that track record is of failing. Yeah, I, I, it, it's, it, it's, it's just perplexing to me. Um, I, I think, you know, I, we saw it a little bit in Buffalo. I, I think we saw it a lot last night that that team has quit on Jason Garrett. Yeah, and... 
Dak Prescott was 27 for 49, but I'd say five or six of those balls that he completed were balls that receivers had to make catches on it that were great catches that were either behind him or in front of him. It seems like the entire offense is out of rhythm. Now, the Bears on the other end, Matt Nagy's caught a lot of hell for his play calling this year. But last night, the play calling was very good. David Montgomery ran the ball 86 yards, 4.3 yards per carry. Mitch Trubisky, 10 carries, 63 yards. Plus, he threw for 244 and three touchdowns. And the thing that stuck out to me here is once, once they started rolling him out, he is successful because his limitations are in the pocket. He is very good on his feet. He's very good when you roll him out because, number one, he doesn't have to read the entire defense. He is limited to this option, this option, or run. And once they did that, it was over. And the thing is this, they can't do that all the time because when you play a well-coached team, they'll eventually stop that with their ends. They'll stop him from getting outside. But when you play a team that's not well-coached, and if you look at it, Detroit's not well-coached. Their last three games that they've won were against teams that weren't well-coached. And Dallas definitely falls there. And Dallas never made any adjustment to limit that. And the thing is, anybody that wants to say, well, you're missing Leighton Van Der Esch, Leighton Van Der Esch is the middle linebacker. The way they were rolling him out, Leighton Van Der Esch, I don't think would have made a huge difference anyways, Anthony. Um, I, you know, I, I think Leighton Van Der Esch would have made uh, a difference in these games that he missed for sure. But no, he's the, you can't put it all on him. No, i put it like this. The games might have been closer, but they were still losing them. The final score in this game was 31-24, to but this is a 31-24 that was over by the middle of the third quarter. No, and it really, it seemed like the Bears were running, like, three plays. Yeah, because they were, and that's kind of my point. They rolled Mitch out. He's either throwing here, here, or he's running. That's the but, three but plays. This is, but, but this is the issue. In the past couple of losses uh, against the Minnesota Vikings, Dallas could not stop the screen. Dalvin Cook, anytime they ran a screen, it would go for 10 yards. And last night, it was anytime you ran the fake and Trubisky, you know, he kept it. Yeah. And the thing is, they never have a defensive end just go straight up field to stop the rollout. Now, when you do that, you're giving them a run inside of that. But I'd rather give them that than Mitch Trubisky on the perimeter with an ability to run or, or throw the ball. So, once again, this is all coaching. And I think the fact that Jerry Jones has not pulled the trigger already is very damning. I think it probably should have been done a couple years ago, but it definitely should have been done last week. And if they're not going to pull the trigger here, uh, it wouldn't surprise me if the Eagles end up winning this division. Yeah, well, I, I don't know. Um, the Eagles have a very soft schedule, but they don't. I mean, you, you think the Eagles would have blown out the Miami Dolphins, and they didn't. Um, I, I, I've said this before. Would it surprise a, a anybody if the Washington Redskins won a couple of games and won this division? They're, what, three games? They need to win three games. It would surprise everybody because, number one, they're going to play the Green Bay Packers this week, which we'll get to in a little bit. And, number two, they're not any good. I, I'm just saying that's how bad the NFC East is. I, I feel like of all the teams, they probably deserve it the most if you take how they've played in the past couple of games. Well, how the about game? this, though? And the one thing I saw that made me feel better about the Eagles was Doug Peterson actually had Philly in their first padded practice in months. And I, I think the point of that going to pads is to make a statement in the final oh, month man. of the season. This is wide open for them. And even though they've got injuries, and, and the great thing is when you looked at the veterans, because I saw like right tackle Lane Johnson was interviewed about it, and he said today was probably our best practice of the year. He said it was cold and windy. All the players enjoyed it. And, you know, a physical practice at this point. I think the Philadelphia Eagles are going to come out, and they're going to win the rest of these games, and they're going to go to the playoffs because they've got Doug Peterson, who's a grown man, and the Dallas Cowboys have Jason Garrett, who's not. I, 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 and I hope they do because Dallas does not deserve it. Well, and you can't risk Dallas they're, making the playoffs. 
winning a game and then you keep Jason Garrett for another year. Well, um, the NFL Network's reporting that not only Lincoln Riley, but Dallas could pursue Urban Meyer. Yeah, but Urban Meyer's not going to work. I, Why not? I, because. I mean, you know more than I do about these college uh, Because Urban Meyer, to me, is a strictly college football coach. It's like you could get Nick Saban, and Nick Saban's a great football coach, but he's a great college coach. Urban Meyer is a bullshit artist. <laughs> Yeah, but you see, that's the same thing in that same Mike Lombardi interview. He questions if Lincoln Riley would work um, in the NFL because of how, you know, because of his college offense. No, and, his college, wait a second, though. His college offense fits Dallas perfectly. The, because this is the thing. Mike Lombardi doesn't know what the hell he's talking about. Because the air raid that Lincoln Riley runs is with a tight end and a fullback. This is not the air raid or the old run and shoot where you can't get things done this way. My question with Lincoln Riley would be the same as it is with any college coach, whether he can get the respect of the men on that team. And that would be the big thing there. But Urban Meyer, to me, is a bullshit artist. I mean, Urban Meyer is a guy who recruits the hell out of players and then he bullshits them. He gets them to play for him and put it like this. Oklahoma, Baker Mayfield's not been a huge success, but there's been a lot worse quarterbacks. Kyler Murray has played well this year. So if that offense didn't translate well to the NFL, those guys would have been complete busts by now. Baker Mayfield was not a complete bust when he had a head coach and Freddie Kitchens was calling Oklahoma's offense, which is what they do. Arizona is running Oklahoma's offense. Kyler Murray has had a successful season. If it was strictly a college offense, I could see that. The air raid that How Mummy ran at the University of Kentucky, or Mike Leach runs at Washington State, this is the perfect example. Mike Leach at Washington State, who is his quarterback? Gardner Minshew, right? Right. Okay. Gardner Minshew is the first Mike Leach quarterback that has actually translated to the NFL. And the reason that's translated to the NFL is Mike Leach was one of the founders of the Air Raid Office with Hal Mummy at Iowa Western University back in 1986. They were an NAIA school that was about to fold. Two years later, to win a national championship with it. They go to Valdosta State. They win a national championship with it. They go to Kentucky. They have, you know, Tim Couch, Jared Lorenzen. They go to major bowl games. Then they get fired there. Leach goes to Texas Tech, wins a lot. He's got guys like Cliff Kingsbury that put up huge numbers but never translate to the NFL. Gardner Minshew is the first quarterback that has translated positively to the NFL for Washington State because Mike Leach, two or three years ago, started to install what Lincoln Riley was doing at Oklahoma, which is playing the air raid with a fullback and a tight end. I mean, hell, there's a lot of teams in the NFL that don't even have a fullback nowadays. So the Cowboys have the personnel to make this work. And I also think this, if I'm Lincoln Riley and I'm going in there, I'm not running the air raid if I'm a good coach because I see I've got Ezekiel Elliott. But you can take a form of the air raid and fit it so you are a predominantly run team with a fullback and you're going to make reads a lot easier for Dak Prescott. And what we talked about before in the past was Dak doesn't throw guys open. He still doesn't, but what the air raid offense does is designed to get guys open quickly. So basically, the wide receivers are running similar to option routes. The quarterback is reading the same thing the receivers do, and if they're on the same page, that ball's out within two or three seconds. And the thing about that is you can RPO with it, and you RPO and with Ezekiel Elliott and Amari Cooper maybe running a slant. So I think the things Lincoln Riley could do in Dallas – would be unreal. Urban Meyer, the other thing about Urban Meyer is, the way you know he's a bullshit artist is, in Florida, when Tebow graduated, and Urban Meyer got busted for having like 32 players that had committed felonies over the previous four years he was there, all of a sudden he had heart issues and had to quit, and he was retiring forever. That was until the Ohio State job opened up. At Ohio State, Shit got a little heavy then because you had all kind of things going on in the athletic department with coaches screwing secretaries and everything. So all of a sudden, Urban Meyer, he's got health issues again, so he's got to leave. 
He's never going to coach again. But now it looks like he might coach again. So I just think Urban Meyer is a scumbag. I think he's a bullshit artist that tricks kids. You can't trick men that make more money than you. You can't trick a grown man that's been in the NFL for 10 years and has put up with a bunch of bull crap. So I don't think Urban Meyer is a good choice. I think Lincoln Riley, I would say, is a 60-40 good choice. But it's a 60 part where if that 60 comes through, you can win a Super Bowl with him. Um, and then the third name linked to the Cowboys is the Clemson offensive coordinator, Tony Elliott. What do you think about that one? I don't know why you would want to bring in the Clemson offensive coordinator who has he ever been a head coach anywhere? No, but that seems to be the, 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 the new fun thing to do in the NFL. Yeah, and how many of those guys have worked out so far? Right. I mean, that's the thing. I mean, you even have teams like the Bengals who are picking guys that haven't even been offensive coordinators. So that may be the fun, fun thing to do, but I would say this. If they do that, the chances of Jerry Jones winning another Super Bowl and would, you know, he's old, would be very small. And this is the other thing about this. Which offensive coordinator for Clemson did they say? Tony Elliott. Okay, because, see, he's not even the offensive coordinator there. He's the co-offensive coordinator because the other offensive coordinator is Jeff Scott. They actually have two co-offensive coordinators at Clemson, and they pay them both a million dollars a year. That's why you threw me off when you threw that name up because I thought Scott was the offensive coordinator. Then when I looked it up, they're co-offensive coordinators. Okay. But, and he's with a great coach in Dabo Sweeney, but I don't think Dabo Sweeney would commute or compute as a, I, 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 between the three, I would take Lincoln Riley in a heartbeat. He is proven as a head coach. Urban Meyer's proven also, but there's a lot of baggage with Urban. And if you thought it was bad before with Cal Billy's being arrested, what do you get Urban Meyer? Because he'll allow any damn thing. Yeah, wasn't didn't he have like thirty something player arrests? Yeah, he had thirty three within a four year span, and one of those was Aaron Hernandez. And Aaron Hernandez had a felony coming out of high school, and he still brought him in. And Aaron Hernandez continually got in trouble while I was at Florida, and Urban Meyer continually ignored it. So I'm not an Urban Meyer fan either way. If he coaches the Cowboys, I really won't like the Cowboys. Right now, I just really don't like Jason Garrett or Jerry Jones. But I don't like Jason Garrett just because I don't think he's a good coach. I don't like Urban Meyer because, I hate to say it this way, but just for the people I've talked to, because I've coached guys that have played for him, I don't think he's a very good person. Well, we know that doesn't matter to Jerry. I know, which is why Jerry doesn't win. Jerry's not a very good person. That's why it doesn't matter to Jerry. If you have low morals, somebody else with low morals is your best friend. Somebody with high morals you may want to keep out because then maybe he'll make you feel bad about yourself. But I I just think it's sad because I think Dak Elliott is a really good quarterback. I think Ezekiel Elliott is a Hall of Fame wide or a Hall of Fame running back. I think Amari Cooper could be a beast. Their offensive line's good. They've got pretty much everything they need except maybe some depth of positions to actually make a legitimate run at the Super Bowl. And Jerry Jones has basically screwed over every Dallas Cowboys fan since 1995, or you really know, 1993. You know, uh, looking back, do you think the Cowboys, and I, you know, I know we know what they are now, do you think they should have overpaid for Jamal Adams? No. Because Jamal Adams, I mean, this is the thing. You don't win by overpaying for people. You win by making people want to play for you. And Jamal Adams is a New York Jet, and he is what he is. He's a really good player. But how would Jamal Adams change the play calling? Not the play calling, but, I mean, improve that defense. But the defense was not that bad. Until the offense went in the tank. And when you're throwing the ball a lot, Anthony, that defense, I think, is at least in the top 10 in the NFL. But the problem is, when you throw the ball 50 times a game, 
and you go three and out after taking a 7 nothing lead. The other team ties it, and then you turn the ball over, and then you go three and out. Hell, your team is, is on the field way too much to be successful. Um, I'll compare it to this. The Denver Broncos, the year before they won the Super Bowl in 1997, the year before, or it might have been 96, the year before they beat the Green Bay Packers in the Super Bowl, they played the Green Bay Packers in the regular season the year before that, and they lost the game 45-3. to And it looked like it was really bad. But when you watch the game, it was 3-3 to to the middle of the second quarter. But the problem was, when you're going three and out and you're turning the ball over constantly, you put so much pressure on your defense that eventually they're going to break. Plus, it makes your defense not trust the offense. So I, I think this. I think you would have a hard time showing me a team – that throws the ball more than 40 times a game that has a really good defense because you're stressing your defense out so much. That's why when a quarterback throws the ball 45 or 50 times, he's usually lost a game. One of the reasons. But you win by running the ball and playing and playing defense. And if they would if they would have lined up last night and just gave the ball to Ezekiel Elliott, they never would have fell behind the way they did. Yeah, but no, uh, no disagreement there. Yeah, and Jamal Adams, I think, is a great player. He would have helped the defense, but he wouldn't have helped throwing the ball too much. And Jamal Adams, no matter how good he is, is going to get tired being on the field all the time. Plus, I just don't think that there is a genuine trust between the players and the coaches, and I don't think there's a genuine trust between the coaches and the front office. And the really bad thing is I don't think there's a trust between the players in the front office. So right there, when you've got that, players are playing for themselves. They're not playing for the coach or the organization. That's an issue. Well, I I don't think they hold – there's no accountability to Jason Garrett because they know that Jerry Jones is in control. That's what I mean. It's the same problem that I see in Cincinnati. You know, it was the old thing back in 2009, 2010, right around there. The rumors here were Marvin Lewis was desperately trying to get rid of Chad Johnson because he was doing a lot of stuff that was detrimental to the team, but Mike Brown would not allow him to get rid of him. And when once that happens, you know, Chris Henry, who actually seemed like he'd turned his life around before he tragically passed that away. That was sad. I, I, I really like Chris Henry. Yeah, but I mean – the thing is, you know, Marvin Lewis wanted Chris Henry gone a year or two before that. And the whole point is this. It's not whether Marvin was right or not. It's the fact that those players saw that Marvin didn't get to make the personnel decisions. And if you're the head coach and you're not making the final player personnel decisions, and I don't care if it's the GM or the owner that's doing it, you have just lost the complete respect of all those players because those players, number one, no longer respect you, and number two... They no longer trust you, and they no longer fear you. And all three of those things are huge between a player and a coach. You know, so the, play, the coach has got to be the guy that makes the personnel decisions. He just has to be, because if he's not, there's no respect there, and it's not going to work. I mean, it's like I, I can compare it to I got offered a job in Green Bay in the IFL, which paid pretty good. I turned it down because there was a GM there, and that GM was the guy who picked my training camp roster. And when I interviewed for the job, and actually Amon Green, the old Green Bay Packer running back, was a minority owner of that franchise – because I didn't trust the other people I was interviewing with, and I was alone with him, and I just said, hey, if it gets down to it, and I want to bring one of my own guys in and get rid of one of these guys, will I be allowed to do it? He told me no. So I told them no for the job. He understood. They didn't. But you know what? If I can't look at you in the middle of a game and say, your ass is out of here, I don't want to be the coach. one of the reasons why I sit here every day and talk to you. <laughs> yeah. Because there's a lot of teams now where you don't get that. Bill Belichick's been successful. 
Because Bill Belichick in the middle of practice would be allowed to cut somebody. Oh, sure. I, I think the only time Bob Kraft stepped in was what it was anything that had to do with Garoppolo or Brady. Yeah. Well, and really it didn't have to do with Garoppolo. It just had to do with Brady. And I still think that franchise would have been much better off with Garoppolo as a starting quarterback right now. Would have been much better off five years from now, for sure. I I don't know many, uh, you know, quarterbacks who can get that Patriots team to a 10 and 2 record. Um, This is the thing. They've beaten nobody. I'm pretty sure Jimmy Garoppolo could have hung out while that defense banged people's heads in and, you know, threw a couple touchdown passes here or there. And like I said, I'm not talking about just for last year and this year. I'm talking about Jimmy Garoppolo is going to be around 10 years from now. Right. No, no, I get what you're saying. Yeah. So short term, it would have been a risk. But to me, I make that switch after last year, after you've won the Super Bowl, because Bill Belichick has been so successful because guys like Ty Law, who weren't on the downside, but were about to be on the downside, he was the one head coach that had the balls to get rid of guys nobody else would have had the balls to get rid of. Yeah, one year too early instead of one year too late. Yeah, and that is why they have been so successful. But, all right, let's go ahead before we get too deep in because we're almost a half hour in and we haven't picked the games yet. Let's talk about the games this week, Anthony. And the first one is the game of the week to me because this game is going to tell us a lot about the Buffalo Bills. They host the Baltimore Ravens. I think the Bills have a legit shot to win this game. Um, I, I do think they have a shot as well. Um, I think if you look at how Baltimore uses Lamar Jackson and Mark Ingram, I think the Bills, uh, to a lesser extent, can also use Josh Allen and Devin Singletary in the same way. And I'm not saying Josh Allen's the same type of athlete Lamar Jackson is because it's not close. Lamar Jackson's a better athlete than probably 95% of the NFL. But I think you can, you know, Josh Allen's. How about this? Josh Allen is the closest thing to Lamar Jackson. I think I think Josh Allen is as close as you can get to replicating Lamar Jackson. Now, right? That and that's exactly what I think the Bills should do because if the Ravens have a weakness, and we saw this throughout the season, uh, it's stopping the run. Yeah, and that's why I'm picking the Buffalo Bills to win this game. I just have a feeling. Um. Plus, it'll throw the entire NFL into a tizzy, as my mom used to say, in the AFC playoff race. It really would. I I, I want to pick Buffalo, but I, I I'm going to stick with the Ravens. I but I think it's would it surprise me if Buffalo won? Absolutely not. And I think you know I think part of me it's going to be one of those games. It's going to be like the San Francisco game. Somebody has to lose. But I think Buffalo is certainly in the conversation. And I hope they they do win because I, I can see New England as a wild card team if Buffalo wins this game and then goes and beats New England. Well, uh, yeah. I mean, Buffalo, if they win this game, could win out, win the division. Hell, they could be the number one seed, Anthony. And they just, you know, you know, Cowboys don't. Do it. The Bills deserve it. They have a coach that the team loves to play for. And we've seen it through the years with Sean McDermott. Yeah, that's what I said last year. I would have got rid of right. him because they play hard for him. Next up, the Washington Redskins will travel to Green Bay to play the Packers. I think there's no doubt the Packers win this game. That point spread of 13 points might be a little much of because the Packers have a hard time stopping to run, and the Redskins can definitely run. Yeah, well, Redskins running backs last week combined for right around 230, 240 yards and three touchdowns on 23 carries between uh, Geis and Peterson. And, yes, the Packers should win this game. But last year, when Geis was hurt, Adrian Peterson, um, he 23 carries, uh, 102 yards or 120 yards and two touchdowns against you know, a similar Packers team, I, I don't know. I'm not going to say the Redskins have a shot. I don't. I, I mean, I've seen crazier things, but I'm still going to pick the Packers. 
Yeah, but I still, I, I think I might like the point spread if you put I mean, a gun to my head the, and made me bet it. The, the Packers have an issue stopping the run. They've given up rushing touchdowns in five or four or five out of their past six games. I think if the Redskins run the ball the way they did last week and accumulate 230 yards rushing with a couple of touchdowns, they win the game. All right, next up, the Denver Broncos. Because that means uh, Aaron Rodgers is off the field. If yeah. You're running the ball like that. That's what I'm, That's why I think they can at least keep it within the two-touchdown spread. Um, the Denver Broncos will go to Houston to play the Texans. I like the Texans here, Anthony. I don't think there's any question on this one. No, the Texans should do the job and, you know, really take care of business. All right, next up, the 49ers and Saints, another game of the week candidate. The 49ers are two-point dogs headed to New Orleans. Is Marshawn Lattimore playing? I do think Marshawn is going to play for the second straight game, yes. Who do you like here? I'm going to go with the New Orleans Saints. Um, you know, and they're going to hand San Francisco, what, their third loss in five games. And it's going to raise a question to me. Uh, the 49ers did beat the Cardinals twice, but they were one-score games. They were very, very close games. And it raises the question is – you know, how good are the 49ers if they do drop their, their you know, go, go down for the third time in five games and uh, lose to teams that, you know, the best competition they faced all year. Yeah, but also the best competition they pay, faced beat them in overtime by a field goal and beat them at Baltimore by a field goal at the last second. So I wouldn't read too much into it either way. Um I'm going to take the Saints just because Drew Brees is there. I thought I was going to take the Niners. But I, I, to me, this game's a toss-up. I'm going to go with the Saints in a close one. And if the Saints win in a close one, I still don't doubt the 49ers yet. But it does make you reconsider things a little bit. Let's put it that way. All right, next up, the biggest game of the week, the greatest rivalry in professional sports, the Cincinnati Bengals in the Battle of Ohio. will go to Cleveland to face the Browns, Anthony. Um, I'm going to pick the Cleveland Browns because, in, you know, he torched the Bengals last year. Um, Cincinnati, they've been playing better at home. Uh, I, I think Cleveland wins this one, and then Cincinnati will probably get them in the season finale or whatever they play next. All right. I like, I don't know. I hate to say it. I almost like the Bengals here because I just think that little of the Browns. I'm going to go with the Browns, but I would say I would take the Bengals in the touchdown because I think Dalton will be able to put some points on them. Uh, next up, in a game that means absolutely nothing now, the Carolina Panthers will play the Atlanta Falcons. I'm just going to take the Falcons because they got Matt Ryan. Yeah, well, not only that, but Julio Jones and Austin Hooper will both play. Hooper's been out for the past month, uh, Jones missed last week. They're getting all their guys back, and the Panthers just fired their head coach. All right, next up, the Detroit Lions will travel to Minnesota to play the Vikings. Is Dalvin Cook playing? Last I heard, he expected to play. Yeah, he's been telling the reporters all week that he's going to play, and I do think he's going to play. Um, and, and the Vikings should win this game. Yeah, I agree. They next have to up, win this game. A game that's interesting is the Dolphins and the Jets, Anthony. It's just interesting. It's not a good game by any means, and it won't be a good game, but it's still interesting. Yeah, um, this is a Ryan Fitzpatrick return home. He played, had a couple successful. Dude, every game he Jets. plays on the road is a return home. Or a French game, I know. <laughs> <laughs> I actually think this could be a, a shootout with these two teams. I think it could, I actually, too. I, I think it'll be an exciting game offensively. How about this? I'm taking the Dolphins just because I like Brian Flores more than Adam Gase. I'm going to also take the Dolphins because they're they're playing. They're like the hot hand team. They're playing for their head coach. And I, it is fun watching Ryan Fitzpatrick do this. Yeah, and he does it every year for about half a season. The other half he plays like crap. But next up, the Indianapolis Colts, who their season is in time jeopardy they're in a must-win situation against the tampa bay buccaneers i like the buccaneers here i like their defense i like the way the defense has been playing i think that if Jameis winston turns the ball over less than three times the bucks win anthony um i i like tampa's defense too i don't really trust their secondary but i i think the tampa bay buccaneers um 
they have enough in their front seven to uh, cause a little bit of, of pressure and disrupt things. I think Tampa Bay will win. Um, and, and, yes, it does come down on Jameis Winston and his turnovers. Yeah, and really, less than three, he wins. Three or more, they lose. But we'll see. He's usually one or the other. Um, the Los Angeles Chargers at the Jacksonville Jaguars in a game that means absolutely nothing. You going with Minshew Mania, or are you going to go with the old man Phillip Rivers? Um, I'm going to go with the Chargers here uh, because they're really the healthier of the two teams. The Jaguars placed Miles Jack this week on the injured reserve list, and he's really their best you know, um, linebacker left standing. Uh, this should be a game where the Chargers should be able to run the ball with Gordon and Eckler and really have their way with the Jaguars, who, you know, they're another team that looks like they just gave up. All right. I'm going to agree with you. The Kansas City Chiefs at the New England Patriots. This one is extremely interesting, Anthony. No, it is. Um, this Patriots offense, I actually think that they have the potential to wake up in this game mostly because Kansas City can't stop the run. Uh, and Sony Michelle in both games last year that he played, including the playoffs, he's had at least 106 yards rushing and two touchdowns. This is going to be one of those games where I think the Patriots are going to establish the run. And if they do that, uh, Brady could uh, go toe-to-toe with Pat Mahomes as they have had in the past. I, I do think the Kansas City Chiefs will win. But I think that we're going to see a little bit of a spark from the Patriots offense, which we haven't seen uh, in a very long time. I hope we do. But also, there's an injury report on Tom Brady and Julian Edelman. But it's New England, so you never know why that's there. I'm going to take the Chiefs to win this game. But it's still, if this was a playoff game, I'd still pick the Patriots. But I'm taking the Chiefs right here. Next up, the Pittsburgh Steelers. And a little duck shall lead them. We'll go to Arizona to face Kyler Murray and the Arizona Cardinals. Um, I like Pittsburgh here just because Arizona seems to be getting worse as the season goes, and they seem to have less and less running backs all the time. Well, what do you mean? They, they have more healthy running backs now than they've had for a long time. But as soon as they play, they get hurt right away. I mean, I, I guess I, yeah. I, I, I have big question marks about David Johnson and his future with the Cardinals. But I think you're right about the Cardinals. I have big um, questions about David Johnson and the rest of his NFL career. Why? Just because he's hurt all the time. This was the first year where he's had serious injury with the back. His previous injuries were like the wrist. Yes, this is but the first the, real injury to where, like, his back or his lower body was hurt. Yeah, but the problem is this. Back injuries usually don't heal up as you get older. And he's and, an uh, NFL I, running I don't back. see David Johnson uh, remaining with the Cardinals. It, it just doesn't seem like he fits in that offense either. So do the Steelers beat him? Yeah, I do think the Steelers go, go ahead and win this game and keep themselves in the playoff line. As crazy as that sounds, and it's, all, it's going to be the defense, and I think it's going to be Benny Snell. All right, now here's a game that's a must-win for both teams. The Tennessee Titans will go to Oakland to battle the Oakland Raiders. Um, the Raiders are now 6-6. Six and six. I think the Titans are 7-5. and five. You there, Anthony? I'm here. Okay. There's some weird sounds going on. But... This game, I think the winner is still in the playoff hunt. Tennessee's probably in anyway, still in the playoff hunt, even if they lose. But to be able to win the division, they need to get this game. I'm going to take the Titans in this game. I think they're physically the superior team. And just all around, I think Tennessee's better than Oakland. Yeah, I agree with all of that. Um, Oakland, they have overachieved this year compared to the amount of talent or lack thereof that they have. Josh Jacobs uh, ha- has been dealing with injuries. Uh, I do think he should be in the running for Rookie of the Year up there with Kyler Murray. Uh, but the Tennessee Titans, they're a legitimate playoff team. Ryan Tannehill's the hottest quarterback in football, and I think Derrick Henry's probably the hottest running back in football uh, because we've seen two quiet weeks out of Christian McCaffrey, and in the past three or four weeks, Henry's been unstoppable, and I think that's going to continue and we're going to see a win from Tennessee. 
All right, another huge game on Sunday night. The Seattle Seahawks will travel to Los Angeles to play the Rams in the Coliseum. Um, I'm going to go with Seattle just because Russell Wilson's on one side and Jaron Goff's on the other. I actually think that this could be a, a, a game that the Rams could win. I'm not going to count them out, um, but I'm still going to pick the Seattle Seahawks because I don't trust Jared Goff. But if they can run the ball like they've been able to do a little bit in recent weeks, uh, if they can get Gurley going, I think they win the game. I'm still going to pick Seattle because I don't trust him. I think even if they get Gurley going, they can't win the game without a big game from Jared Goff, which I think if he gets going, Gurley, then I think Goff could have a big game. But I'm going to go with the known factor here, which is Russell Wilson. Next up on Monday Night Football. I'm not going to watch Monday Night Football next week, probably. The New York Giants will travel to Philadelphia to play the Eagles. Well, maybe I will, because Eli Manning will be playing. Um, I'm going to go with the Eagles here. I think the Eagles are going to straighten everything out and get rid of Jason Garrett for you. Well, that's what I wished for last week, and it didn't happen. Um, I think I'll wish for it again, but I think... Eli Manning is going to pull out the win. Okay. I just have a gut feeling that this is, you know, Eli Manning wants to go out on top. Or, and, and on top for him right now would be winning a game. <laughs> well, he might have three more opportunities, too, because high ankle sprains usually take a while to heal. So he may be playing more than one game. Anything else you want to talk about before we wrap it up today, Anthony? Um, no, I, I mentioned that Julio and Hooper are coming back, and that that's really the biggest news. And you know, Dallas sucks. So it's not as much fun. Cover just about everything. It, I I just it's not as much fun to do the show with you when you admit they suck. I mean, you got to be realist here. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Well, until they win next week, and then you'll be back on. Who do they play next week? The Rams, somebody. Oh, yeah, they're not going to win next week. All right, guys, we're going to go ahead and wrap the show up. Anthony, you want to tell everybody where they can find you? Yeah, you can follow me on Twitter at the Real NFL Guru. You can follow my show at the FM Face Off. We can be found in all the top social media and podcast platforms. All right, guys, you can find the Grilling Truth at Grilling Truth, and you can find us on all medium platforms all together, including Spotify, iHeartRadio, iTunes, TuneIn, Spreaker, Stitcher, wherever you find podcasts, you'll find the Grueling Truth. So, for Anthony Servino, I'm Mike Goodpastor. You've been listening to the Grueling Truth, where the legends speak. <laughs>